So welcome to another session of numerical methods. We already started introducing the Monte Carlo method. So you maybe have now um, a nice intuition. So what we wanted to do was to uh, calculate the expectation. And we started here with the simple example where we look at the expectation on a discrete sample space. So we have a finite number of events, omega one to omega n here. Okay, and then it's just the sum or calculate the value of a random variable on that event and multiply with the probability. Yeah, and we did uh, a strange thing. Uh, we uh, approximated the probability by just taking the sequence to, of drawings from these events. So here are these uh, events, and we take a sequence uh, of drawings from these events, and then approximate the probability by just counting the indicator function. How many times does a specific event occur divided by the number of uh, drawings? And yeah, if you plug this in, you arrive at this funny um, approximation here, where now the probability part is actually just approximated by this drawings from the events. And you just evaluate your random variable on this sequence, and then you calculate the average of the values Z of XK. And if you look at this um, here again, and recall that maybe the events are just a small number of events, say, if you throw a dice, yeah, it's one to six, then this means that if this M here is large, you calculate here the same value again and again. Yeah, so Z of five yeah, is calculated again and again. Uh, so it looks a little bit like a waste. Yeah, but I already mentioned that this may become a useful approximation if the number of calculations that we do on the left-hand side, so the size of the sequence is maybe much smaller than our space of uh, events, yeah? so then the uh, capital N. <clears throat> okay, so that was uh, our introduction to the Monte Carlo method. Basically, the method is already here. And I would like to, uh, to discuss today convergence result. So in which sense are we converging here and how fast is the convergence? But uh, before I do this, I have two small, maybe trivial remarks that are important to give you the right intuition. Also important because you see a drawback of the method and uh, also important to see a huge advantage of the method. Yeah? So how we generate the method in high dimensions. So first let me, uh, recall a little bit what is a drawing of a random variable. So in the following, we consider the case of a random variable, say capital X, and a drawing is actually modeled by looking at independent IID, so identically distributed random variables, X, I tilde, that have the same distribution as X. So, and this setup can now be interpreted as modeling independent drawings of X. Well, in the following sense that a single event on that sequence of IID random variables, so that is here a single event omega tilde, on this sequence can be considered as different events on the random variable X. So you might consider this M as X of omega I. 
So that means uh, to model the drawings, I actually create multiple copies of the random variable and they have to be independent. Yeah? I would like to have independent drawings. And of course they should be similar or the same. So identically distributed. And to do this, so how do you do this? How do you model IID random variables? You have to enlarge the space. So the point is that this omega i and omega tilde, they actually come from different spaces. And the reason why I mentioned this is because the convergence result that we will look at today, they often start with let xi be a sequence of iid random variable having the same distribution than x. And now from this interpretation, you see that then what I sometimes call a drawing of the random variable is just a single event on that sequence. So to model this sequence of IID random variable, we introduce the product space omega tilde, which is the Cartesian product of our omegas. So that is actually then representing the omega tilde, which is my sequence or vectors of events from the space omega. Okay, so omega i is from omega. Then my sigma field is the sigma field generated by the product of the sigma fields. Yeah? So I have all the subsets. And my probability measure is just the product. Yeah, So I define now the P tilde. It's just the product of the uh, individual probabilities on the subspace. Okay, that's maybe familiar to you, but that's how you set up now the space. And then you can look at this sequence of IID random variables, which is then just XI of omega tilde. So XI tilde is defined as X of omega tilde I. So in that sense, having n different realization of x, no, x of omega i, so of one random variable. So this can be interpreted as having one realization, omega tilde, on this vector of iid random variables. Okay, so that's how usually a drawing is modeled. And now if I have a drawing of a random variable and it's a specific realization is actually one event, omega, omega tilde on this sequence. If you go back to our little plot, you know, this omega tilde here is actually one such line. Yeah. So this here is an omega tilde, and that here is another omega tilde. Yeah. So that's maybe omega tilde one, and that's maybe omega tilde two. Yeah. So the whole line yeah, is now my omega tilde. So the second remark I would like to make is how do we generate now a vector valued random variable. So vectors of IID random variables with IID components. And this remark is also very important. I mean, it's trivial. Yeah, maybe you can see it as an algorithm, how you do it. Uh, but it's important because we will see that how we can move to higher dimensions. And most importantly, that this is linear. So given a sequence of IID random variables, X1, X2, 
XD, XD plus one, and so on. We may now construct a sequence of corresponding IID vector valued random variables in D dimensions. So the important part here is that we are now looking to D dimensions. So that's now a vector x1 to xd, uh, transposed if it is a column, with iid components. And we just do this by populating the components one after the other with elements from the one dimensional sequence. So if that is here your sequence, say xk, and you have these elements here, then you construct your sequence, say now let's call the vector value sequence yk, then you construct your sequence yk, say for the case d equals two, it's two dimensional, by just taking this guy and placing it here and this guy and placing it there. And then you move on. So it means that you construct this sequence by saying ykj. So the element yk of the sequence, the component j of this element by taking xk minus one times d. So you move in blocks of d plus j. Okay, so here's maybe a bit nicer the picture. Yeah, that's our sequence xk. We look at the example d equals two. So that's the sequence of my IID random variable, variables xk. And we populate the guys one after the other, and then the vector is complete. Yeah, of course. The components are now IID, they are independent and identically distributed. And of course, all the vector elements are IID. So that's a simple thing. Yeah, you would maybe do that just intuitively. Yeah, programming in your computer, you would take um, a sequence and just do that. Uh, there are cases later when this can go wrong. We will discuss that. But the most important part now is that this method scales linear in the dimension. So the effort to generate one element of the d-dimensional um, sequence is just d times the effort to generate one element of the one-dimensional sequence. Yeah, Because I need d elements of this sequence, it's d times the effort to generate one element. So we need d one-dimensional sample points to generate one d-dimensional sample point. Yeah, that's trivial. But if we later look at the Monte Carlo method, it's exactly this little building block that allows us to do Monte Carlo in higher dimensions. And we will then have as a result that the effort of the method scales linear in the dimension. And if you look at integration methods, which we will do later, uh, you will see that classical integration methods, they scale exponentially in the dimension. Yeah? So there's the curse of dimension. So it's exactly this little trivial thing that creates this huge power of the Monte Carlo method. Well, it's a little bit more. Yeah? We will see that in the convergence result because there the dimension of the random variable does, does not enter, but um, that's, that's an important, important part here. Okay, so that were two small remarks. Maybe I should give um, a definition for the word Monte Carlo approximation. Later, we have another definition for the word Monte Carlo integration. The uh, point is that for Monte Carlo method, there is no clear definition in the literature. Yeah? Sometimes uh, it, it is used a little bit differently. Yeah, uh, So 
if I would try to give it a definition, I would say that we call the running average here, so one divided by n, sum from one to n xi of a sequence of iid random variables on the same probability space, well, with um, mu being their expectation, so they should be integrable, we call that the Monte Carlo approximation of the expectation. Actually, we still have to prove that. You just had this little motivation that this converges to the expectation. Um, then if we use this in the application, well, that's a the theoretical object. It's a random variable. If I would like to use it as a true approximation, I have to evaluate it. So in the application, I evaluate this at a single event. So then of course you can interpret Xi of omega as a drawing of the original random variable X. Yeah? So average the drawings is like take a single event on the Monte Carlo approximation of an IID sequence. So when I use now this event, so when I evaluate this guy, then I call this the Monte Carlo simulation approximating the expectation. And it is this what we will do in the application. Or when we, when we implement this in the computer. So I may make this remark maybe several times, uh, but this here is uh, giving us a little bit of uh, bitter taste because we are using a single event and what we will see next are convergence result in probability. Uh, so we have to look how this fits together. Yeah, but uh, for the time, maybe just, just ignore this, uh, this little bug. Yeah, so now let's have a look at uh, convergence results. So we collect some convergence results and they all start maybe with the sentence that we consider a sequence of IID random variables. Yeah, but note that have in mind, if I take then a single event of this, I can interpret this as modeling a drawing of a random variable. So the first one is the strong law of large numbers. So that tells us that we actually do converge to the expectation. So let xi, so x1, x2, and so on, be a sequence of real valued random variables on the same probability. Uh, I assume that the expectation exists. So here my mu is the expectation of Xi. So actually all the expectations are the same, yeah, because they are IID. Then I have that my Monte Carlo approximation. So one divided by N, I from one to N Xi, the limit of this is equal to mu with probability one. So that means that the probability of the set where the limit is equal to mu is one. So I have that I converge here to mu almost surely as n goes to infinity. Okay, again, this little remark, that means almost surely if the set 
omega, so if you are, for example, in an infinite state space, um, is a null set. So that means it could occur, but the probability that it occurs is null if I'm in an infinite space. Uh, if that's uh, the case, yeah, then it could happen that I have no convergence on this event. So if I would later use this method by just looking at the single event, that could be dangerous. So there are generalizations to this theorem uh, under the name of ergodic theorem or ergodic theory. And what's nice here is a little bit the interpretation. So our Monte Carlo approximation. So the limit of one divided by n sum xi, this is called the time average. So that means that I interpret now here xi as a sequence where i models a little bit the time. So like in subsequent drawings. And our expectation. So the mu is expectation of xi. Yeah? All the xi's have the same distribution. So it's the expectation of x uh, one. This is called um, the space average. So the time average is take the sum xi. And the space average yeah, is the expectation. And if you now say the think that the expectation is the integral x1 or xi of omega dp omega. So then you see that this here is somewhat the weight with which the event uh, occurs in the space omega. And this here is a little bit the weight with which the drawing occurred in my sequence. Yeah, so, so you see that this is taking the integral over the space omega or taking the integral, uh, in, in that case, the sum uh, over the time i. And we have the result that space average and uh, time average um, agree almost surely. So time average is equal to space average, almost surely. Yeah, what we had was a convergence result. So there is some convergence, but we still don't know uh, how fast do we go and um, which n is may be useful, yeah? So because in my computer, I can go up to a certain number, yeah? I'm averaging, yeah? So in my application, the n here is finite. So I'm also interested in a convergence rate. And maybe the central limit theorem is a first candidate that gives me a little bit of intuition here. So again, I have a sequence of IID random variables, x1, x2, x3, having the same uh, distribution on the same probability space. And now in addition to having the expectation of these guys, I also assume that I have the variance. So I assume that I have sigma squared, the expectation of xi minus mu squared. Then we have for all a, b. So I have here a lower bound a and an upper bound b. That the probability that 
okay, that looks now a bit strange. One divided by square root of n times sigma. Then the sum of xi minus mu, that this lies between these bounds. So the probability of this, this converges to capital phi of B minus capital phi of A, where phi is the cumulative normal distribution function. Yeah, So the distribution function of the standard normal. Uh, yeah, so if you make B and A quite large to the positive infinity and small to the negative infinity, uh, of course, then the probability goes to uh, one, but then I have no information. If I make these guys here small, so I would like to lie in this interval, interval yeah, then of course here the probability can become small. Um, but there is maybe a small helper. There is here the square root of n. Uh, okay, so how does this look like? So just multiply this whole condition there with one divided by square root of n. That doesn't change the condition. Yeah? If I lie uh, in the interval, then one divided by square root of n lies in the interval where the bounds are multiplied with one divided by square root of n. Okay, so I can just modify a little bit this condition here. So I have a one divided by square root of n times a, and then I have a one divided by sigma. Yeah, one divided by square root of n times one divided by square root of n is one divided by n. I have now the sum i from n, uh, one to n xi minus mu. Okay, so taking the average over mu is just mu, yeah? So summing mu is just n times mu, dividing by n is mu. So I can actually leave the bracket or pu put the bracket uh, around the summation here. Okay, so this now lies in between one divided by square root of n times a, one divided by square root of n times b. And then, yeah, let's maybe multiply with the sigma. So I have a sigma here on top. And now you see that this here is actually our error. So that looks suddenly nice, yeah, because um, it means that uh, if I take n larger and larger, then the error becomes smaller and smaller. It stays in this interval as one divided by square root of n becomes smaller. Yeah, that looks already like a convergence rate. Well, unfortunately, the theorem is not useful to us. Why? Well, because of this holds only in the limit for n to infinity. Yeah. So I do not know if this holds before uh, we reach infinity in a certain sense. Yeah. So otherwise, if I would have known this, I could have prescribed certain values b and a, which give me here. Uh, the probability. So make B and A the interval large gives you here a large probability that this holds. But then you have a large error, error bound, but you can make the error bound smaller, but by making N large. That would be a nice result if there wouldn't be this thing here that it only holds in the limit. So maybe a bit useless for our application. 
Yeah, here is just uh, again this little transformation and this uh, result. And the remark that in this form, it's not an error estimate because it considers the limit n goes to infinity. And we really do not know the rate of convergence. But the next guy in my small list, the Chebyshev inequality, can fix this. And we get for a fixed n, an error estimate. Unfortunately, a probabilistic one, but we get an error estimate. And here's the Chebyshev inequality. So I have a square integrable random variable, so I can calculate the uh, expectation and the variance. So I have mu and the variance, yeah, or sigma squared, this guy. And then we have that the probability that x deviates from expectation of x by more than epsilon is smaller or equal than the variance of x divided by epsilon. Okay, so that's now a result for a single random variable and not for my Monte Carlo approximation. So we have to work a little bit to make this applicable. But before we do this, let's have a short look at the proof. Uh, I just have here the proof under the assumption that I have a density. So I assume that x, ha x has a density phi because then it's uh, very simple. I start on the left-hand side with the variance. So the definition of the variance is integrate x minus expectation of x squared times the density. So that's the definition of the variance. And then from this integration domain, I cut out the region where x minus the expectation is smaller than epsilon. So I only integrate over the error region that is outside my error bound. So I cut out here this, this region. Of course, if I cut this region out, I make the integral smaller. Yeah. So note everything is positive here. So I make the integral smaller. Then if I know that all these values here are absolute value larger than epsilon, then I know that this stuff with the squared is larger than epsilon squared. So the next thing is that I just can replace this with an epsilon squared and I make it smaller again. Okay, now I'm integrating over this domain here, a constant, yeah, that's just the probability of this domain multiplied with that constant. Okay, and then you divide by epsilon squared and you arrive here at this estimate. So the result can be generalized to other moments, yeah, for x in um, LQ, but okay, we don't use that. So how can we now derive um, an estimate for our Monte Carlo approximation from the Chebyshev inequality? Maybe I write this here. So what I do is I replace the x in this by our Monte Carlo approximation. So x is one divided by n, sum i from n, xi. Okay, so then I have that here, I have exactly my Monte Carlo approximation. So what do I have here? Yeah, this is the expectation. So I have the expectation of x is one divided by n, the sum, from one to n, 
the expectation of XI, yeah, because expectation is linear, yeah, and then all the guys are IID. So then I have that this is just mu. So I have then here the Monte Carlo approximation, and here I have the mu. So what I have here is exactly, I'm outside a given error bound for a fixed n. So now I have a fixed n. So next guy is the variance. Yeah. So for uh, the variance, this is the variance of one divided by n sum i from one to n x i. Yeah. Variance is the guy squared, expectation of the guy squared. So I get a one divided by n squared if I move the one divided by n in front and I have the variance of this sum of xi. Yeah, and now the guys are iid, yeah, so, so they are independent, yeah. The variance of a sum of independent random variables is the sum of the variances. So I have that this is one divided by n, the sum one to n of the variances xi. Yeah? So this here is because this these guys are iid. Yeah, the variants are all the same. So the variance is a sigma squared here. Well, let's call it sigma squared, the variance. So I see that this gives me, uh, sorry, this is a one divided by n squared. <laughs> Otherwise I would lose one. So I, I, this gives me a one divided by n squared times n times sigma, so I get a, so sigma squared, so I get a sigma squared divided by n. Yeah, okay, so you see that on the right-hand side, you have now a sigma squared divided by epsilon squared divided by n, and the right-hand side becomes smaller if n becomes larger. So that means the probability that I lie outside this interval uh, becomes smaller as I increase n. But that looks already nice here because now the limit n to infinity is no longer here. Yeah, I have a result for a fixed n. So we get now the Monte Carlo convergence rate. So x1, x2, x3 is my sequence of IID real valued random variables on the same probability space. Uh, I know my parameters mu for the expectation and sigma squared for the variance. And then we have what I just proved. Uh, we have that the probability that my Monte Carlo approximation deviates from the expectation by more than epsilon this is less or equal sigma squared divided by epsilon squared times n. Yeah, okay, but hmm, this looks maybe a bit strange. Yeah, the probability becomes larger. Maybe usually we would like to have something, I would like to have a method that is somewhat reliable. So I maybe prescribe a certain probability. So I would like to introduce here a constant delta. So one minus delta. So delta is uh, the cases when I miss uh, the result. So one minus delta is now my uh, reliability. And uh, I would like to have that the reliability is larger or equal this prescribed value. Uh, and then I would like to have some error bound. Yeah? Um, so how can we achieve that? Well, first of all, you can move here to the opposite. Yeah, you can have here a smaller than epsilon. And then you get here um, a one minus, yeah, a one minus 
larger or equal a one minus this constant. And then I can make the following substitution. So now let's introduce, uh, yeah, let's introduce a delta and set epsilon to sigma divided by square root of delta times square root of n. So if you plug this in here, um, actually this will be epsilon squared, so it will be sigma squared, yeah? so the sigma squared is canceling, then it will be 1 divided by n, so the n times this is canceling, and it will be just a delta. So that means that this constant there on the right, sigma squared divided by epsilon squared times n is equal to just delta. And then you move to the uh, opposite event, which gives you here the larger or equal one minus delta. And you get the second estimate so epsilon is now replaced with sigma divided by square root of delta divided by square root of n. And what do we have now? If you forget about the probabilistic part, so if you forget about the probabilistic part, the probabilistic part tells me with a certain probability larger than something, the following holds, then I have that my error stays below sigma divided by square root of delta times one divided by square root of n. So I have convergence with one divided by square root of n, a constant times one divided by square root of n. So this guy gives me the convergence rate. Okay, and unfortunately, we have again the remark that this holds only in probability. So when we later use this and apply here a specific event omega, we are not really sure if this holds, yeah? so this error bound or this convergence rate holds for this event omega. Yeah, this looks a little bit disappointing. Now we have a nice convergence rate, one divided by square root of n, but we will also see later that this probabilistic nature of the method is maybe not a bug, it's a feature. It's the feature that enables this convergence rate to be independent of the dimension. So the proof, yeah, we did the proof on the previous page follows by just plugging in here our definition of the Monte Carlo approximation, uh, noting that the variance is sigma squared divided by n. And the second line follows by using this substitution. So again, note that in contrast to a classical convergence rate estimate, so this holds here only with a specific probability. Uh, and in case that we need an estimator for the variance, yeah, you know that there is an unbiased estimator, maybe you can, can check this. That was it on convergence result. So, and my next session will be Monte Carlo integration. So now I like to apply this to calculate integrals.